Okay, I think I'm finally ready to film this video. Quite a while ago now, I put on Instagram that I wanted to film a video about working with brands and be totally transparent. And I got so many messages from you guys with loads of questions, loads of questions, which is what I was expecting and why I wanted to do this video. I think that times have changed. I think consumers, which includes myself, are very savvy. And I think that the influencer world i have talked to before about how i hate the word influencer but the kind of influencer slash content creator world has become a bit confusing and i think although if you're in it like me over the years we've kind of learnt how things work but if you're just a viewer i think it can be quite confusing and i've just noticed that so many people are getting things really mixed up and very confused and feeling quite untrusting of the content creators that they watch. So I wanted to do a video from my perspective, talk about how I work with brands and the kind of people that I know in my circle. This isn't gonna cover every country, it's not gonna cover every content creator. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do is really clearly define how this kind of space is divided. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've written it down here. It's kind of divided into four sections. So let me just do a quick like Casey Neistat style and write that down on a piece of paper for you. Okay, here we have affiliate marketing. I use someone called Reward Style. Not someone, I use a company called Reward Style. And that includes things like Like to Know It, which you've probably seen. Um, shop pages on my blog and can any affiliate links that have a little star next to them that includes like swipe up on Instagram then there is display advertising which includes YouTube ads and ads on blogs which I actually don't have anymore so that's my only display ads that I have brand partnerships which is working with brands so I'm gonna put sponsored content and then you have PR, which includes press trips, free products, discount cards, and I've probably forgotten some kind of subheadings, but just so you can see as an overview, affiliate display, brand partnerships, PR, that's kind of how it's split. So now that that's clear how those kind of separate things are defined, I'm gonna get on to the questions which I've split into three sections. The first one being affiliate and display because there weren't many questions there. It's not that complicated. And I have got notes in front of me, partly because I won't remember everything that I want to say. Also, I'm terrified I'm gonna just say something slightly wrong and then people are just gonna pick up on that. So I've written myself notes because I wanna do this properly and I wanna put up this video feeling confident in what I've said. So the first question was, I just wanna clarify the percentage you get from someone actually buying, not clicking, but buying a product from an affiliate link. I don't earn any money from people clicking on a link. There are some websites that do that, I don't use it. So I only earn money if someone buys a product. And also worth mentioning that that doesn't include if they return the product. You don't earn money if the product is returned. So my affiliate, um, I've had a look and it ranges from like five to 15%, but for me, it rarely goes over 8%. So it's really not that much. And I always use other people's affiliate links because it doesn't make any difference to the person buying a product. You guys don't spend any more um, it just helps out the content creators that you watch. The next question is, I'd like to know how it works with YouTube ads, the ones before a video starts. I'm curious, is YouTube actually able to, to be a day job without sponsorship? So YouTube ads are done by cost per thousand views. So you earn per thousand views. And that's done by something called CPM, cost per mil. And everyone's CPM is completely different. So your earnings will fluctuate different throughout the year. They used to be like fixed CPMs, but now it's just completely different depending on your content, the time of year, how many videos you make, so many different things come into CPMs. They're too complicated for even me to be able to explain. But basically you can have ads on your, before your videos, during and after. I usually put mine on before and after. I don't put them during. I used to experiment with that and I found that it, it just kind of interrupted the content. I don't love it when I'm watching videos and there's an ad in the middle. So I'm not gonna put that up for you guys even if that means earning more money. In terms of earnings, this might help you guys kind of gauge a little bit, but I earn less from my YouTube videos in a year than I did when I worked full-time as a marketing manager before I quit my job to do this full-time. So that's affiliate and YouTube ads. The next section is all about PR, public relations, which normally means non-paid for kind of coverage. So the first question is, when a brand sends you something, do you always have to talk about them or is it only when you sign a contract? Um, no. 
you don't have to. There's no obligation to give coverage when a product is sent to you by a brand. Do you ever feel pressured to give a brand or a specific product a positive review because you enjoy working with that brand in general or because they have invited you to amazing events, etc.? I think over the years, um, a lot of us have definitely created relationships and friendship with the PRs who work for the brands. So in some way, you might be less likely to want to like bash a product because you like the PR, but I would never Per, I would never like give a positive review to a product just because I like the brand. If anything, I would just not mention it. I get sent a lot of stuff, maybe like five parcels a day with lots of products in it. And most of the stuff I don't mention because if I was just showing you guys everything, it would just, it would be overwhelming. So I usually only show you the stuff that I like. Although there are some occasions where that is different. For example, Isle of Paradise, I don't know if you guys saw on Instagram, I tested out that fake tan and I know Jules, I think he's a really good guy. It was a really cool, new, exciting brand, but because of the hype, I felt like I wanted to give you guys a really honest review and I gave it a pretty negative review, but they dealt with it so well. They emailed me and they said like, sorry to hear it didn't work for you. Why don't you try this product? I think this would work for you instead. We'd love for you to meet up with Jules. He can explain to you how to use the product. He can give you a spray tan. And they just kind of embraced it rather than seeing it as a, a negative or a failure. So I think it doesn't make a difference in terms of giving a positive or negative review for me. Did you ever experience that if you gave a rather negative but honest review that brands no longer send you their product? Yes, I have experienced that before with brands. Um, it was a bit shocking at first because I just thought that that was, that's what the blogger space is all about. I thought that all brands understood that. But to be honest, I don't need the product. I know that sounds a bit like maybe arrogant, but I could go out and buy a lipstick if I wanted to. So I don't rely on them sending me product, free product. If they want to stop sending me products and stop inviting me to their events, that is fine. And honestly, it's a bit of a shame because I think, well, I probably won't be able to work with that brand now, but if they're gonna act like that, then they're probably not a brand that I would wanna work with anyway. So it is rare, but some brands take it really personally and it's just, it's not personal. It's, it's products and makeup and marketing, so. How are influencers chosen to go on trips and are the trips fully paid by the companies or do they just pay flights and accommodation? Okay, so press trips. Press trips have been going on for decades in the kind of journalism world. How it used to work, I guess, is a brand would take journalists away and it would very much be in exchange for coverage because you have to remember those journalists are employed full time. So they've got to get permission from their boss to take time away from the office and they're there for a reason to give coverage. They're also getting paid whilst they're on their trip. They're getting their normal salary. So it's slightly different with how it works with us. And I can't speak on behalf of brands, but how I think they pick people to go on trips, I think it depends on how they see that person, whether they fit with the brand kind of look and ethos of the brand. They look at numbers of followers. Um, usually when I go on a trip, there is a mix of someone who has millions of followers, someone who has a few hundred thousand, and then someone who has less as well. There's normally quite a range. Some brands think about who gets on with each other in terms of like creating content when you're out there. I think every brand kind of looks at it differently, but yeah, the trips are normally fully comped, fully complimentary. The flights are paid for, the hotel is paid for, all the food and drink, everything, most press trips, everything is free. And it's amazing. We all feel very lucky to be invited on these trips. As I said, they have been happening for years and it's just part of like PR budget that brands have. The next question is when you get invited on a blogger trip, do they often invite you to bring a plus one? Is that how you manage, is that how people manage to bring their partners or do they cover the costs themselves? Plus ones are very rare. I, I think apart from Disney, I've never been able to bring a plus one. Usually I've kind of worked around it because me and Anna will get invited on a trip together and it's so nice, one, knowing you're going away with someone you know, because it can be really intimidating. As exciting as the trips are, you don't know who you're going with and traveling is a very like, you really get to know someone when you're traveling, especially if you're scared of flying or you get a bit homesick, it, you can be in quite a vulnerable state. So it's a bit intimidating if you don't know who you're going with and I love traveling with Anna. Often brands won't invite us together because they assume we have exactly the same audience and so they, they're thinking about it in more, more strategically, like why would we have two people who have the same reach? But the way I see it is that when you're with someone you know and get on with, you create better content. You can take photos of each other, you can film and vlog with each other. It's a bit tricky if you're not away with anyone you know because then it's difficult to take photos and really that is what the brand wants. So it's in their best interest for you to have someone with you who can take photos and stuff with you. But um, yeah, Rich has a full-time job so he can never come anyway. But it's nice when you're going away with other 
creators that you get on with. Also, to answer that question, I think sometimes people do pay for plus ones. I don't know though, because I've never done that. When a brand flies you somewhere and pays for your accommodation, is that the extent of the compensation or do you also get cash payment for the content you produce? It seems unfair for brands to call the trip itself payment and not pay people for their time like any other company would for a work trip. So unless the content is disclaimed as an ad, no, it is not paid for. The trip is paid for, but the content isn't controlled in any way. You're not asked to put anything specific. So yeah, often trips are just free and we can make content if we want, but we don't have to. Often a paid for collaboration will coincide with a press trip and that's because there's content there to work from. If they're taking you to an amazing country for a launch and they also have marketing budget to work with you on that, then often that will coincide, but that would be treated like a normal job. It would just happen to happen on a press trip. Basically, if it says ad, it's been paid for. If it doesn't, then it hasn't. How do you not get overwhelmed with the amount of products brands send you? Uh, we do. It's, it's really lovely. And at the beginning, it was very exciting. But yeah, it is overwhelming. Just because I feel bad about the amount of product that goes to waste. I don't really like doing giveaways because I feel like it's a bit like bribing my audience. Like, I'll give you this if you subscribe to me. And I don't, I don't like that. I also just think the recycling, when products are sent in like massive packaging, it just breaks my heart in terms of the things that can't be recycled. But yeah, it is overwhelming. And I, I often like it when brands email saying, would you like to try this product? Or this is our new collection. Which shades do you think will work for you? Because we don't need 200 lipsticks. There's no way I could possibly ever use all of them. But often these brands just have our addresses from years and years of like this relationship. And we don't get asked if we want the product before they're sent. So it's quite difficult to manage. It's really exciting seeing all the new beauty launches. But yeah, it's, it's, it is overwhelming. And with that, we don't want to show too much either because we don't want to seem like we're showing off and often content creators get a lot of hate when they show the amount of product that we get sent for free. Do you get special blogger discounts when shopping? Yes, um, some brands give you discount cards, which is probably something people don't realize because you don't have to disclaim anything like that. But I just think it's a really clever way for brands to work with people because it encourages you to be more genuine and authentic with your purchases instead of being sent a dress that you might not usually wear and then feeling like maybe you have to share it because it's quite an expensive dress and they sent it to you even though you didn't ask for it and you have this like ongoing guilt. I'd prefer to just be able to shop in that brand, that brand's shop that I already like, um, but have a bit of press discount. Like I said, journalists have had it for absolute years. Um, and yeah, I have maybe like four or five discount cards for some of the brands that I shop at quite often. So yeah, that's that's really nice and a really nice way to work with brands, I think. It encourages more of a long-term relationship. I've never disclaimed free or discounted products because you don't have to. And also, I think it would be too confusing disclaiming ads, free, discounted. There's too many different things to disclaim. I think for me as a viewer, it's important to know if someone's being paid to say something. But other than that, I think you should just trust the content creator that you're watching, which is so important. I would never recommend something if I didn't like it, whether it was free or whether I paid for it. Often if something is very expensive, I'll say I got sent this just so you guys don't think like, wow, Lily started buying really expensive things, which she doesn't normally. But um, it's tricky because you don't you don't have to. And it's a bit like with home renovation. I'm, I've got a few um, bigger things gifted in my home renovation. It means given for free, but I haven't been paid to talk about it. And because the brand aren't controlling the content, I don't have to disclaim that um but it's tricky for me to figure out how to disclaim that just so you guys don't feel like cheated in any way often brands don't like people saying if a content creator's got it for free or discounted because then they'll get bombarded with emails from newer content creators asking for the same thing it's it's very confusing you just have to have an element of trust with the person you're watching knowing that they wouldn't recommend something they didn't genuinely like no matter if they paid for it or not. I haven't really changed the way I disclaim stuff since day one, and I think that's the kind of clearest I could be. Okay, now onto the marketing section, which is the most complicated, and I think what people are most scared of, which is why I wanted to make this video. So I really hope this doesn't like blow your mind and confuse you and make you doubt everyone you watch on YouTube, because that is not what I'm trying to do. The first question is, can you explain the process of working with a brand from start to finish. Now, I wasn't sure whether to just talk through this or if it's gonna get very confusing or whether to write it on a bit of paper. I might do both. Let's try it this way first and see what it's like. So a brand will contact either myself or my agent, Gleam, who I've been with for like four years or something. At that point, if it goes to Gleam, often my manager would just message me or phone me and she'll just like shout a brand at me. She'll just be like, made.com. 
I'm just saying that because my made.com poof is over there. I'll either go, mm, no, not for me, or, oh yeah, I love that brand. And that's kind of the first step before any money or anything is discussed. If I'm interested, they will then request the product for me to try. Yes, Lily's interested, please can you send her the foundation and she'll give it a go. And that's so important for me, that step. If I like it, I'm reading from my paper because it's confusing, if I like it, uh, Gleam will then request from the brand their campaign messaging, timings, budget, scope of work, which means like, do they want a video, an Instagram, a tweet? And then that will kind of get pitched back to me again. If I like all those things, or there's a lot of back and th forth at that point, I then decide the creative. I then suggest what will work best for me and my audience. And then there's just a lot of back and forth. At that point, a brief is written up and a brief is created mainly for my benefit. So then when I sit down and create the content, I've got everything in one place and I know what I'm doing. And that again is negotiated back and forth a lot. In that brief, there'll be like three key messages, some social handles that I need to use and hashtags and any extra information I need to know about the product. At this point, I'm still not committed to do the job. The job goes into production, as in like I film the video, I take the photos. And then it goes to the brand for approval. And at this point, it's only factual amends. So only if I got something wrong that was agreed in the brief, can it be changed? Other than that, it's just for them to see it before it goes live. I do any edits if I need to, and then it goes live. And that was a lot of information there. And I'm gonna kind of break down some of those points in the questions that are coming up. Cause I know some of you are probably thinking at this point, what the hell is a key message? What do you mean by factual amends? And what are you talking about when you say you've got a brief? And I'm gonna try and cover all of those things in these following questions. But that is the kind of overall process of working with a brand start to finish. So the first question is, how do you choose who you work with? Is money a factor? So as I just mentioned in the process, money comes into it after I've decided whether I like the brand and the product. Obviously money is a factor, this is my job. And I know what my worth is. You know, I've been doing this for eight years and I know what brands spend on other forms of advertising I know my worth in terms of like what my time is worth and that's to do with like what other brands are paying me for my time so I can compare to that my time is worth my reach in terms of like how many people I reach so of course money is a factor like any other job but often I'll work with brands who have less budget than I usually work with just because I love that brand and I really want to do the job. So it's also very flexible. Do brands tend to contact you directly about sponsored content or your management? Or do you put an idea to them about how you could advertise their product or both? I got so many questions about this, which I thought was so interesting because I've rarely, rarely ever contact brands to work with them. The only time that happens is if I've got a long relationship with the PR that I've known for like four years and I just wanna to take to the next step and say like, let's do something more interesting than just you sending me products and me putting it on my Instagram stories. Let's do something I can invest my time in and do something really cool. And that's probably the only time I ever pitched to brands. 95% of the time brands come to me. At the beginning, they were all coming direct to me. And I think when you sign with an agent at the beginning, you feel a bit like frustrated because you think, well, I'm just, I'm just putting all these jobs through them. I'm just giving them their 20% and I could be here without them. But it's always like that at the beginning. And then gradually it kind of shifts and, you know, I started getting jobs that other people in my agency were turning down and the more well-known my agents become, brands go straight to them. So I say now it's an equal amount. If they come to me, I put them straight in touch with my agent. And if they come to my agent, they let me know. And it's just a really open conversation. Do you get to test out the products that has been sponsored before agreeing to work with the brand? And do you decline to work with them if it's not something you like, enjoy, or proceed to give your honest feedback? This step is 100% the most important for me. I always try a product if I haven't tried it before or look into a brand before working with them. The only exception I have to this rule is the job I did with Simba mattresses because the job entailed the mattress arriving in this massive box and me kind of opening it and putting it onto the bed. So it was impossible for me to try it first without me then having to like fake my reaction. So in that case, if the mattress had arrived and I'd vlogged the whole thing and not liked it or something had gone wrong or delivery had been bad, then I would have just said, I don't want to do this job anymore. It wasn't what I was expected and I'm not happy with it. And that would have been fine. I would have pulled out and you guys would have never known about it. That's the only exception. Every other job, I've always tried a product first. How do you, the company, decide on the amount to pay for your work? 
So this is tricky. Sometimes brands have like a set amount of budget to work with you. Sometimes they have no idea. They'll just say like, we don't know what it costs. Can you let us know? Sometimes they come to my agent and they're like, we've got this much to play with. And brands are constantly shifting their budget now as they maybe do less traditional advertising, move over to this or that, you know, it depends on the time of year, what budgets they have. But I guess things that they factor in, as I said, reach so how big the audience is and who the audience is if it's right for them how long the job takes to produce whether you need help a photographer or videographer whether you need to do it on a weekend need, whether you need to stay over the night somewhere to do it being affiliated with that brand is a big deal um, on both sides and my agency work around like rough rates they have like a kind of rough rate but there's no such thing as a rate card as such because like i said it's different every time i've done so many brand so many brand jobs where i've done it for less than my normal amount because I love the brand and I just wanna make it work. And I've done it sometimes where they have more budget for influencer marketing. But undercharging for a job isn't really good for anyone. I always think like I could do loads and loads and loads of jobs and like charge less. But one, like we've spent so many years in this industry trying to convince brands of our worth. So me undercharging isn't good for anyone else out there that's trying to like charge a set amount. But also I don't wanna be doing five ads a week. Like you guys would hate that. So my aim is to do less jobs over the year that are like better quality rather than loads of jobs for less amount, if that makes sense. I think like long-term brand partnerships are where it's at. You often talk about working with brands to integrate the sponsored product organically in your content. How long does the back and forth and idea development usually take? Often brands come to us really last minute. I think they're still trying to get their head around like working in this space and often they will come and say, we need this next week. Or like last week I got a job on Wednesday for that Sunday. So sometimes it could be such a quick turnaround which makes it quite stressful and it means that we always have to be on hand 24 seven to be like working on briefs and prepping for jobs. But in total, I would say 70% of the time is spent prepping the job, 20% of time is spent creating the job, and then 10% is spent once it's gone live and collecting kind of any data afterwards. So I hope that gives you a bit of an overview of the kind of back and forth. It's most of the time is spent on that kind of back and forth beginning stage. Do you consider yourself being more picky now in a positive sense when it comes to working with brands versus when you started blogging? Have you noticed a change in your behavior? I've always been picky. I've always just thought like, would I be embarrassed if my friends saw this? I'm not good at lying, so I've never been able to kind of lie about anything like that. Um, but my taste has changed and it will always continue to change. So there might be products that I put in an ad video at the beginning that I no longer like because my taste has changed or something I would never have thought I would have wanted to work with, but now I like, if that makes sense. I think content creators have the right to change their mind about things, their opinions and their taste but there are definitely more conversations to be had now because more people understand the space. The next question is, I would want to know if they just pay you a fixed amount for doing a video on their brand or is it related to every purchase that product with your link and how many views plus the fixed price? This question like sums up how confused people are. So it's very important to me that there is no sales pressure. None of the work I ever do is dependent on you guys spending any money. If a brand said to me, we'll pay you depending on how many clicks the link gets or how many purchases people make, I would just say no, because that means that I've got a motivation and incentive to sell to you guys. And that is just not what it's about. So no, it's definitely always a fixed price that is agreed beforehand. And it's just nothing to do with how you guys spend your money. Do you ever negotiate your fee or cost with brands when given a monetary offer? Is this done by your agent? Yes, this is all done by my agent, both because of time and also like, it's just a bit awkward. But yeah, if, if, if I wanna do the job, I would never start negotiating on money if I wasn't interested anyway. But if I wanna do the job and I love the product and the money just isn't right, whatever the reason is, yes, jobs can often be negotiated. I find that usually if they know their budget, then they kind of stick with it. So yeah, that conversation is done between my agent and the brand, but it's my decision. They'll say to me, this is how much they've got. Do you wanna do this? And if I say, no, I don't feel like that's right, then they'll start negotiating. It's all, it's all agreed through me first. Is it possible that you film a video for the brand and they don't approve it? For example, you didn't mention some points that they think are important in their product and you have to do the video all over again. Okay, so let's talk quickly about key messages. And I'm sure you guys know that when you watch YouTuber videos and there's an ad, often they are mentioning some like key points, whether it's to do with ingredients or launch date or how it makes your skin feel. There are key messages and 
yes, maybe it's a shame that it's not totally authentic, like you would naturally speak about a product, but this brand is paying for the coverage. It's marketing at the end of the day, and there's always gonna be key messages. That's the difference between a paid job and a not paid job, is that if you pay for it, you get specific messages, and those are negotiated. I would never like say something that just totally felt icky to me. But yes, often there are gonna be like three key messages in a video. Have I ever had it where a brand doesn't approve it? It's very rare as the brief is all agreed beforehand, which is something that's very important to me and my agent. We spend so much time on that brief so that we don't have to refilm. Often there is a period of time where I might have to re-edit because I've said something that isn't correct. Normally it's only factual, factual amends, which means that if I've factually said something wrong, especially if it's legal, that is where they have a right for me to edit. It. If I was doing an ad for mascara and I said, oh, it makes my lashes look twice as long as they normally look, that's like a legal claim and I can't say that unless it's true. So that's where it kind of gets a bit tricky. But no, I would never refilm. I've never in the past had to do that because because of the brief, I know what I'm doing beforehand. The next question is, when you work really hard on something and then get told that they don't like it once they review it, how does that work and does it take up more of your time? Like I just said, I wouldn't redo it if I didn't do something factually wrong, but it is a bit heartbreaking. As someone who used to work like in a normal job in an office, I thrive off feedback. I have feedback from you guys, which I absolutely love and live for, but then I also like feedback from the brands that I work with, and often you just don't hear from the brands. You either do a job, it goes down well, and you just don't hear from the brands, or you do a job and there's like a back and forth of editing and getting it right, and then you just never know if the brand is happy or not, and I, if I know a brand is disappointed, or it, you know, the process wasn't as smooth as they had hoped, I feel really like heartbroken because I just don't want anyone to be disappointed. So I find that quite difficult. I love a good like pat on the back and you don't really get that from the brand side of things. But often I would just ask a brand for feedback. How did you feel that job went down? When in your career did you decide you were comfortable working with brands? Were you ever approached before you were with a management team? If so, is the process the same or different working with a brand on your own versus management? I was with them pretty early on before brands started working with us properly, but I just know that it's so much easier in terms of time, going back and forth, I just wouldn't have the time to do it. And Gleam obviously have a legal team and a finance team which do all of the complicated stuff I could never do, like contracts and chasing payments and all of that. So it makes it a million times easier in my opinion. As someone who works for a brand, what do you like when working with brands and how can brands work with content creators to get the best outcome for both parties? I think it's just working together on the creative rather than coming to a content creator with a finished idea. We want you to fly to the moon, wear a red dress and say this, this and this. We want this exact sentence said, like it's too prescribed. We know what works best with our audience, of course, because we've been doing this for so many years and we put up videos regularly and we know how you guys react. I feel like we know you just as well as you know us. It's much better if a brand comes and says, we've got this product, would you like to try it? And if so, should we chat about how maybe we can integrate this into your content? That is just so much better than than having this prescribed idea. I would never work from a script because you guys would know that it's not me talking. So just being really flexible with the key messages and the creative helps a lot. When a brand approaches you about creating sponsored content, do they ask you to show it in a specific way? For example, it has to be in a video or in an Instagram or do they give more freedom to fit it where you like? I think it's a mix. I'd say probably most of the time they kind of know what they want, but often they'll just say, we wanna work with you, how do you think's best? And I'll suggest it. Like for example, my favorite ways to work with brands are on YouTube and Instagram. Um, just because they are my favorite and I prefer my blog to be a bit more of like a personal behind the scenes separate thing. I just find that sponsored content goes down best on Instagram and YouTube for me and for like I, would, I wouldn't feel comfortable a brand sponsoring a tweet anymore because I know how quickly those tweets just get lost and I don't think they would get out of it what they want. So often I will suggest sometimes they know exactly what they want. Since you have an agency, are you ever worried that sometimes that can hinder what brands work with you in terms of smaller brands finding it intimidating. No, because whoever contacts my agency, they will always let me know whether there's budget, whether there's no budget. They're just lovely girls, a really, really nice team. And often they're excited for me if a brand gets in touch who they know that I like, like whether or not it's gonna earn them any income or not doesn't affect whether they help me. They've been helping me so much with house renovation stuff and that's not a job, I'm not getting paid. They're not getting any money for it, but they're helping me with all kinds of things. So they're not just like, greedy money grabbers. 
any small brand can get in touch with me directly or with my brand, with my agents, and I'll always get the say on whether I'm interested or not. Do you feel put off working with a brand if they've already worked with a lot of other creators on a product because people would just think it's good money? Um, I'm not worried about people thinking it's good money. Often if we're working on a campaign with a brand um, and say we've agreed that we're gonna put our Instagram up at one o'clock on a Tuesday, I'll put that Instagram up and then I'll see 10 others and I'll think, oh, why has the brand done that? But often we don't get told who else is part of a campaign. I'll always ask, but we don't always get told. And I just, it's not that I'm embarrassed to be doing it at the same time. I just think, wouldn't that have been so much better to stagger it? It's just, I think it's a bit much for the audience to see everything at one time, but that's really totally out of our control. I wouldn't be embarrassed to do a job that someone else has previously already done, because I think as long as you like the brand or product, that's all that's important. Often me and Anna work on similar brands or the same brands, and we just have a different approach, and I think it's fine, and our audience is slightly different anyway. What do you think about creators who use very expensive and hyped up products, but are ambassadors for lower end skincare brands? And I always think, do they actually use it? Well, I think it's important to note that people can like high-end and low-end products. There's no like, she only uses high-end, she only uses low-end. Obviously we get sent a lot of high-end products, so the majority of what we use is probably gonna be high-end because wouldn't you use those if you got sent them too? But you can have, your taste can range. Like for me, I don't even really think about price that much when I talk about products. It's just how it feels and whether I like it or not. But saying that, often I've turned down big jobs, like really, well-paid exciting jobs because I don't like the brand or I don't like the product and then I see someone else do it and I think oh I really hope that they like it because if not that is just shady but each to their own you can't control what other people do and like I said earlier you have to have an element of trust with the content creator that you're choosing to watch and if you feel funny about the content they're making then just don't watch them don't put yourself through it have you ever started a relationship with a brand or a deal and had to call it off what are your deal breakers, red flags when exploring a new possible brand deal? Yeah, I've got a couple of examples, which I won't name for obvious reasons, but one with a brand who I absolutely love and was desperate to work with for years. They were on my like wish list of brands I would love to work with. And that was such a shame. And that's more to do with them just being too big of a company. There's too many like legal constraints. They were too worried about the like, competitors being in the background of my videos. And that's just something I can't control. If I'm vlogging and someone's got a product in the background that is a competitor, I can't like blur that out. It's just, it's if brands are too worried about that kind of thing, they need to stick to traditional advertising because that's just not what influencer marketing is about and then the other one they just had unrealistic expectations of what the content should look like and they kind of wanted to control it and make it look like something that was on their channel rather than considering what fitted with my content competitors is often something that brands really worry about because they don't want to be paying for the content and then have one of the competitors kind of in there for free just for the ride but it's difficult for us because we know that what we do is authentic in that we have lots of different brands and products all at the same time. So that's always quite tricky to navigate. Some YouTubers add ad in the video minutes before talking about a product instead of clearly telling people it's an ad in the title or the thumbnail. How do you feel about this and why doesn't YouTube take action? In terms of disclaiming ad, it is so, so complicated and I hope that I kind of explain this well, but it's very confusing for everyone. There is something called the ASA, which is the Advertising Standards Authority, and they set guidelines. So even that, it's a guideline, it's not like a law. They set guidelines on what to do, and they're constantly learning and changing. It's very difficult to keep up. It's such a new space, no one really knows. Whereas like in a magazine, it might say promotion in the top hand corner, if it's like being a paid promotion, or in a TV, show if there's like a product placement it might be on like the credits there's there's all different ways on how to disclaim it before the asa kind of came about in terms of our space i always used to write in the description box this video is sponsored by this brand just because i felt like i wanted to tell you guys and then when it became more official um i put ad in the title i now put ad in the thumbnail because the way I interpret what the ASA have said and everyone interprets it in a different way. I interpret it that I just need to warn you guys before consuming the content that there is a paid for promotion in there. If the entire video isn't controlled by the brand, if there's just a small section, then I think yes, you can just kind of put it up on the screen whilst that bit's there. But to me, you guys have already clicked on the video then, you've already given me my view, which is how I kind of earn YouTube ad money or views. So I prefer to warn you beforehand so you can make the informed decision whether or not to watch the video. 
Yes, that means I probably get less views on an ad video than someone who doesn't do that, but I think it's more honest. So that's why I choose to do that. But basically, whether something is officially an ad or not, according to the ASA, is whether the brand has controlled the content. So it's not even necessarily about money, although the way I see it is if you're getting paid for something, it's an ad, and if you're not, it's not. But it's also to do with whether they're controlling the creative of that content. I think just doing this job has shown me like how much of that there was around before influencers became a thing that we just maybe weren't as savvy towards, you weren't as aware. You know, when you read celebrity interviews and magazines and they talk about what's in their handbag and they happen to have this specific lip balm that's probably paid for and it will be disclaimed somewhere, but we just never used to know those things were ads or like, if you're watching a soap opera and they're drinking a specific drink, that's probably sponsored as well. It's just with what we do, we're extra transparent and extra obvious about it, which is why everyone's kind of freaking out a little bit, I think. The next question is, I remember you worked in marketing before blogging YouTube became your full-time job. Has this affected how you approach working with a brand or a brand's confidence working with you? Um, I think it's just made me more professional. I would always tell a brand if, I thought that their expectations were off. Like once I had a really nice makeup brand that I love, they wanted to work with me on a lipstick launch and they wanted sales. They gave me like a swipe up link for Instagram and they said, we wanna generate as many sales as possible. And I said, I just, I don't think this job is right for me or for you because I know that my audience probably won't buy a lipstick from a swipe up link. I wouldn't, I don't really buy makeup online. I'd just, I'd see it and go, it's a nice lipstick and then I'd go to Boots and buy it. So. I wanted to just manage their expectations because if they work with me and then they're disappointed, that's not good for me, that's not good for them, it's not good for other content creators that they were potentially thinking of working with in the future. So I think in that sense, I've, I'm a bit more businessy in terms of making sure I manage everyone's expectations. How do brands measure whether an ad has actually had an impact? Um, well, I can't speak for brands, but I think it depends on the objectives of their campaign, whether that's sales, awareness, downloads, clicks, Maybe they've got a discount code with like a trackable link that they can look at the analytics. But then, like I said, often people will see an ad and then they'll just go into store and buy it and that's impossible to track. So brands just kind of need to be aware of that. I think that it's not always something you can get analytics from. But I once had a brand come up to me and say, you know, thank you so much, your link, this was just like a non-paid thing, but your link to our shop sent 10,000 people to our website. He was like, no one bought anything, but it was incredible. So I kind of loved that approach to it. Cause he was like, he was just excited to have people visit the website. If they didn't buy anything, it didn't matter. It was just that they were kind of getting to know the brand. Um, and I think that's a really good approach. Why is it that you can accept a weekend away with a brand or blog that experience showing, using all the products, yet it's not classed as an ad? Um, that's because they're not controlling the content. There's no key messages. They don't approve it before it goes live. They don't get to like see the photo before you put it on Instagram. You can mention other competitors and they're not paying you for the content. Do you ever feel envious when a brand approaches a blogger friend and not you? I never feel envious in terms of like not wanting them to get that opportunity. I'm always happy for my fellow content creators to get every like opportunity they get. The only time that probably applies is if there's a brand that I have loved for years organically on my own without kind of all talking to them. And then maybe say like for the first time they work with content creators and they don't choose to work with me. I'm just always a bit like gutted that, I don't know, just cause I think that it's so nice if I already love the brand, but brands are so different. Some choose to work with people who they know already love the product. And then some choose to work with people who they think, well, they're already loving it, so we don't need to work with them. Let's work with the people who aren't talking about us already. And I think it's nice for brands to work with people who already like their product, but every brand is different. Do brands care more about numbers of followers or engagement of followers? Again, I think it depends on the brand. We all know that subscriber numbers mean nothing because you can be subscribed to a channel and not watch their videos. So I think they look more at views and like likes on a photo, which is more about engagement really. Comments and who the audience is and how they react to that person's content. I think, I think engagement is more important but every brand is different. I think I feel like I've ended every question with every brand is different. Oh my God, this is gonna be the longest video of all time. I hope you guys are still with me. What happens when a sponsored video goes down badly? How does keeping your integrity versus seeing dollar signs work? This is the final question. So I would never work with a product I didn't like, but often what happens is a job will come in, I'll like the product, tick, I'll like the brand, tick, but then their key messages are sometimes a little bit 
off. And that I find so frustrating because I'm like, here I am being totally honest, working with a brand and a product I, that I like, but their marketing campaign, the, the campaign they've chosen, I just don't think will work with my audience. And then it's all about a compromise. Often I will say to the brand, just so you know, I don't think this key message will go down well with my audience. I know them well and I think that you might get some hate on this video if we don't change it. And they're just so kind of stuck in their ways of having their marketing campaign. They're like, no, we wanna keep it like that. It's important for our overall campaign. Cause you have to remember a marketing campaign isn't just about working with someone on YouTube. There'll be billboard ads, magazine ads, and they like it all to tie in together. So for me at that point, I think, well, should I risk it? Because I'm being honest here. I'm, I'm working with a brand and a product that I like. Um, and you can never really predict how something's gonna go down. Sometimes I'm really worried about a video and I think, sorry, there's a lawnmower out there. And I think I'm gonna get hate on this and then it goes down fine. And then sometimes I think, oh, I love this video and I get loads of hate on it. So I don't wanna base my like income working with a brand on fear and predicting how a video is gonna go down. So sometimes, and I'm sure you guys can think of an example on my channel where I've worked with a product and a brand that I like, but the key message was a little bit, mm. and negotiating key messages is really tricky, but at the end of the day, I think if I go home and I can sleep at night knowing that I do genuinely like that product, then the rest is just marketing fluff. I always take learnings away from a job. If a job goes down really badly, I will sit, possibly with my managers, and say, why did that go down so badly? And I will learn from it and think about that next time. I think that we are doing very well as content creators to keep things honest and open, and I think it's a really exciting new way of advertising that I, as a consumer, much prefer to kind of seeing a celebrity on a TV ad using a shampoo that you don't know if they've ever used before in their life. We have a close relationship, so you guys know you can trust me. But anyway, terrified to put this video up, hoping you guys get it, hoping I didn't say anything wrong, and I really hope it was interesting, eye-opening, and I hope you will stick with me. And thank you so much for watching. Oh my God, this is gonna be like an hour long video. I will see you guys in the next one. <laughs> Bye.